This programme contains graphic depictions of animal anatomy. Viewer discretion is advised. Imagine if the government found a complete body of a dinosaur and then assembled the world's leading paleontologists to carry out a secret autopsy. With only access to fossils, even the most brilliant minds struggle to fully understand how these giants live. Now, for the first time, eminent scientists can cut into the body of one of the greatest predators the Earth has ever seen. What secrets can they learn? What myths can they dispel? What can they reveal about one of the deadliest dinosaurs to have ever lived? Tyrannosaurus Rex. Today, this team of experts is about to make history. They will dissect the world's most complete and detailed T-Rex ever seen. Luke Gamble is an all-action vet who is leading the autopsy. I've got to find out how this beast died, but we've also got a chance to figure out how it survived, how it worked, what made it tick. Matthew Mossbrooker has discovered groundbreaking dinosaur fossils. We're going to learn things about this dinosaur that we've only been able to speculate on up until this point. Steve Brusate is a leading expert on the anatomy and biology of T-Rex. The biggest, baddest meat eater that ever lived. And I've been studying its bones for a decade, but I want to know how it lived. That's the mystery that keeps paleontologists up at night. Paleobiologist Tori Herridge brings with her experience of dissecting an Ice Age mammoth. I'm interested in seeing if the theories that scientists have put together hold water when you actually do see a Tyrannosaurus rex in the flesh. The team is about to get its first glimpse of this awesome dinosaur. It's massive. It's huge. When I first saw the T-Rex, I was overwhelmed. I just nearly wept. It was just so beautiful. My first thought was, this thing's an alien. It was so different from the skeletons that I'm used to that it took me a few minutes to realize this was the animal that I studied. Forty-three feet long. 13 feet tall. This monster is one of the largest land carnivores of all time. Oh, jeez. Look at the size of these claws. Wow. Weighing seven tons, its name means king of the tyrant lizards. This skin is just amazing, isn't it? Yeah, the armor plating. It's so thick. Over 50 serrated teeth dominate its half-ton head. Look at that. Absolutely terrifying. It's one of the most familiar of all dinosaurs. But T-Rex's body still holds surprises. What's on the arm? Bristles. It's probably the best description of them. They go down to the tail tip. This forensic examination will explore how T-Rex evolved 
to become the dominant species of its age. All right, Luke, you've dissected everything from barnyard animals to elephants. This is clearly not an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? To be honest, we've got to approach this with the same logic that we'd approach any autopsy. So let's just review the external features. I need to know if it's an adult or not. If we can sex it, ideal. Let's create a portal here. Let's get right inside the belly of the beast. And that's going to have the key to the answers we need to know. If we know how it died, we can learn how it lived. We're going to get dirty. We're going to get very dirty. Luke regularly performs animal autopsies. His start point is establishing if old age could be the cause of death. So, how on earth do we age this? The secret is in the bones. Maybe you've seen a tree that's been cut down, you look at the tree stump, you see rings. Sure. And you can count the number of rings. That tells you how old the tree was when it was cut down. Dinosaurs are the same. No way. One ring each year. So this right here, that's what we have to cut. To see the rings, the team needs a cross-section of a bone of the leg. Oh, challenge one. How do we get the leg off this beast? This is your area of expertise, I believe. T-Rex's lower leg is two and a quarter feet wide and packed with dense muscle and bone. Matt, maybe get some of the guys and mark up exactly where I've got a cut. And try and raise this leg and support it so it's steady. I'll go and get some gear. We're going to need a bigger knife. Yep. Luke's dissected cows, horses, and elephants. But does he have a blade big enough to slice through the massive hind limb of the T-Rex? Each of T-Rex's muscular legs weighs nearly two tons. Hey, guys. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a surgeon. <laughs> okay. Gonna be needing these. <laughs> Where am I gonna cut? Right? In through here. Luke must cut through nine muscles and a bone as thick as a branch of a tree. I was not expecting a chainsaw. But it makes sense because this is a big animal and you're going to need something bigger than a you know, sensible and sedate anatomical knife. I thought, all right then, there's no going back from this. OK, job done. A little trickier than the dogs and cats and horses you're used to, huh? <laughs> Nothing to it, buddy. <laughs> Luke has amputated this limb just above the ankle. Nice, thank you. Thank you. Despite being a massive six feet long, this isn't the entire leg, it's just the foot. Before they extract the all important bone sample, Tori and Steve want to take a closer look at the foot's anatomy. Let's see what we've got here. All right. I want to have a look around this side because that's where the sharp stuff seems to be. So am I looking here at the foot going along up to the ankle bone here? That's right. Absolutely. So this is the part that would be the equivalent to the arch of our foot. Right. And these are the toes. So we've got three toes with some absolutely enormous, <laughs> rather frightening looking claws at the yeah, end. Yeah, very scary. And tucked under here is a fourth claw. Well, it's kind of bird-like, isn't it? It's like the three claws of a bird and that back one, which in your typical, you know, sparrow or pigeon would be used to perch mm -hmm. and grasp around a branch, potentially. You got it. I think if you look at this, you look at the skin, it's scaly, it's green. It maybe kind of looks like a crocodile or a lizard. Mm -hmm. But you look closer at the structure of the foot. There's nothing croc-like about this. This looks like an overgrown chicken. Does it do anything in a T-Rex? It probably doesn't do very much. This is what did all the work, those three main toes. And it was all the work because the, this dinosaur, this T-Rex, only walked on its toes. A seven-ton dinosaur on the tips of its toes. T-Rex isn't light on its feet. Its toes impacted with the same force as a car hitting a wall at 30 miles per hour. That's why T-Rex had special shock-absorbing pads on its feet. 
and these are also found in birds. T Rex walks like a big bird. Vet Luke thinks he's found evidence of an injury. Look, can you see these ridges? Uh huh. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's different. Well, it feels like crepitus, so it suggests there's some sort of trauma under the skin. What we should do is just x ray. When bones break, air can bubble to the skin's surface, causing a spongy feeling known as crepitus. Just don't drop it on me. All right. OK, it's perfect, perfect. While Luke carries out the X-ray, Steve and Tori are trying to age the dinosaur from the rings in the bone sample. We can look at a super thin slice under the microscope to count those growth rings. I'm seeing some really, really, really clear lines. It's really easy to count them at first. Um, but then I hit this bit. Let me just pick up on the screen for a second, because actually I'm struggling to count the lines. So I'm going to guess in the realm of 20, but I mean, it's really hard. It, they seem to really pile up on each other towards the edge. Now, what's going on there? That's really interesting. And this, this holds the key to figuring out the age. Because during its teenage years, from the time it was about 10 years old to the time it was about 20 years old, it grew at a supercharged rate. It put on about two or three kilograms, so about five or six pounds of weight every single day for 10 <laughs> years. So imagine that teenage growth spurt. But then towards the end of that growth spurt, growth slowed down yeah. and you start to get very little growth and those lines pile up. So it's still laying down a line of bone every year incrementally, but it's not growing as fast. There's less distance between each line, hence that really dense dark bit at the top. Yeah, so this is an animal that has basically stopped growing, but it still had some years to live. So I think somewhere in the realms of 20, would that make sense? Yeah. So this animal probably didn't die of old age. Probably not. Scientists have only found T. rex remains in a narrow band from southern Canada to Texas. They named the most complete skeleton Sue, and its bone rings revealed it died when it was only 28 years old, the oldest recorded age of any T. rex. T. rex, it grew fast, it lived hard, and it died young. Matt, Luke, yeah? come over here. So those are the rings, are they? That's can you what see tell them? us. Nice. That is amazing. Each dark line you can see really visibly. That is right. absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had a pretty good time. So that hunch on the soft tissue trauma proved right. Matt and I just x-rayed it. If you have a look at the image here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what we've got here is a lateral view of the femur. All right, the knees here, hip would be up here. And you can see there's a slightly oblique transverse overriding fracture, and it's quite a clean break. Yeah, the femur is the strongest bone yeah. in the body. How do you break your femur like that? Well, we sit a bit in racehorses, for example, but it'd be a trauma as such fell on a rock or a clean impact. So we see this a lot, actually, in smaller animals that might have a hit by a motorbike or something like that. Big motorcycle, though. Yeah. <laughs> Big motorcycle to hit this guy. But you know what? What it tells us, this definitely would have been a game changer. A massive injury like this would immobilize any animal and leave them unable to eat. Could this T-Rex have died from hunger? Let's just get into it. Let's get inside. Let's look at the stomach. Let's see what's in there. Work out if it's starved to death, because that's going to tell us if this wound was the end game for this guy. Mm. OK. OK. I have a feeling we're going to definitely need The this. answer is deep within the creature's body. Watch the paw. All right, here's your saws, Dr. Luke. Enough knives for you there? There's never <laughs> enough knives, Tori. There's no point tickling this, is there? So let's just get on with it, cutting into an abdomen. Paleobiologist Tori is the only member of the team to have previously autopsied a prehistoric creature, a 40,000-year-old mammoth. I've been here before. The stench hit you. I mean, your um, eyes and your nose were streaming. It absolutely reeked. <laughs> Let's get it done. OK, 
Okay, we're in. Tori, could you bring me that really big, long, sharp yeah, one? Yeah, on it. Okay, cool. Let's swap them over. Okay. That's, that's it. That's not guys. Ah, oh, this is hard going. It makes elephant skin feel like velvet. Yeah. Okay. Right. <sighs> guys, come on in close. Give me a hand with this, all right? Well, I'm going to go across them. Hold tight, all right? Tori, come in closer. Come in closer. Oh, it's getting wet. All right, guys. All right. Mind your thumb, mate. I don't want that off. The team isn't just cutting through skin. Oh, we're good. We're good. We're good. Oh! <laughs> Soak it up, guys. Soak it up. There is a thick slab of insulating fat. This is rancid. Come on, come on. And three layers of muscle full of blood vessels. Wow, that smell is something else, isn't it? Oh, oh, oh. oh. What did this guy eat? <laughs> I got in my mouth. Shit. <laughs> this is why I study bones. <laughs> Okay. Okay, up. Let's go up. Let's go up. I've got it. I'll pull it out. Oh, it's a bit hot. Almost there, guys. All right. Peel this back. We're going to open it like the trunk of a car. Luke is expecting to uncover a rib cage. What he finds is unlike any animal he has ever seen. My goodness me. What's going on here? Hang on, this can't be ribs. This just can't be ribs. The team carrying out a post-mortem on a T-Rex has hit a problem. They've uncovered a row of bones. Wow. Oh, look at those. Oh, and fossils, you usually just see bits and pieces, you know, one or two bones, but they're all together. Oh, wow. So far, the team has discovered their T-Rex has feet like a bird. A bone sample has revealed it didn't die of old age. But it had a broken femur, which could have caused it to starve to death. What we're doing now is we're creating our portal into the belly of the beast. In here, we're going to get the answers. We're going to find out not only, hopefully, why it died and if that leg had anything to do with it. We're also going to have a chance to understand how it lived, how it survived. Keep it going, guys. Stop. The evidence lies in the dinosaur's internal organs. But bones are blocking the team's path. The whole belly of this animal is covered in bone, in addition to all those muscles. So this guy was a reinforced tank. Matt Mossbrooker is the curator of a natural history museum deep in T-Rex country, and he recognizes these bones. This feature, that's a croc feature. They are gastralia. When I dissect crocodilians, from the bottom of the sternum all the way to the pelvis, there's a short series of gastralia, like these. I've never seen them this big with muscle around them. This is, is something else. In crocodiles, these bones provide abdominal protection. Also called belly ribs, they don't attach to the rest of the skeleton. Scientists think T. rex had over 30 gastralia, but they are yet to find a fossil of an entire rack. Well, guys, you know what? It's wonderful they're here, but we've got to get through them. Luke thinks the equipment he uses for dehorning cattle might work. This is just going to be hard sawing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to thread this embryotomy wire, which is steel, and we're going to put it through, and it works like cheese wire. And it's going to go through these holes here. Uh -huh. I'm going to hook it around the base of the rib. OK. And then what we're going to do is pull it out and work it like a saw. Look at the easy. Well, this wire is razor sharp. There we go. Wow. So that's one done. With eight more to cut, Tori and Steve decide to investigate T-Rex's infamous jaws. These hold the secrets to the way this giant dinosaur fed. So, first thing I see when I look at this mouth is, oh my goodness, it's full of really sharp teeth. About 50 of them. What T-Rex could do, and it was very good at this, yeah. it could 
chomp. Right. And it was a record setting chomper. And it was mostly these teeth, these big ones right in the middle, yeah. that were doing the chomping. So I think we should try to take a look at one of I'd these. I'd love teeth. to do that. So yeah. can we get a car jack or some kind of scissor jack or something? Okay. Come on in. <laughs> You kind of resist while you feed it in. Is that helpful? Open a bit. The front eight teeth yeah. scrape. Just keep holding. The rest of its 50 teeth are dedicated to crushing bone and ripping flesh. Lovely. Lovely job, thank you. Okay, all right. These teeth at the side of the jaw, the bigger teeth, these were the steak knives. These were doing the cutting. These were cutting up Triceratops mm -hmm. steaks. These were crushing. And so I think it would be really nice to get a look at one of these Oh teeth. yeah, definitely. To fully understand the size and function of these teeth, the team need to extract one. This one seems a little bit wiggly. Yeah, exactly. We need a sharp blade and a man who can wield it. Luke. Hey, Luke. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Mind uh, taking a look at a tooth no, no, for a minute? Love Matt to. can do the ribs. I'm going to assume it's just like, for the moment, a massive dog. <laughs> because this looks like a canine. Canines generally have one okay. root, so I suspect that. What we're going to have to do is probably just break down these periodontal ligaments. So yeah, ligament holds the, the teeth in. It does, right. yeah. So yeah. we're just going to stretch that out. Ligaments are tough pieces of tissue that connect bones together. Oh, oh look at that. Oh, it's coming out. It's coming out. Wow. Okay. It's <laughs> oh, oh, a perfect extraction. Look at that. Measuring 12 inches long, this serrated tooth is the perfect tool for ripping into flesh. This is just all about piercing, biting. How powerful would a bite like this be? Well, this thing had a lot of force. Yeah. It can puncture. As it well as could slice. puncture. It's an armor-piercing shell yes. is what it is. So biting through a car, totally doable. I think T-Rex, he could have probably bitten through your Land Rover. I would say. No, that. never. <laughs> I think oh, so. We'd I'd fall out of love with this T-Rex <laughs> if it bit through my Land Rover. Crocodiles and alligators have the strongest bite of any living animal. Some species can snap their jaws shut with a force of 3,700 pounds. Enough to crush the skull of a zebra in a single bite. But that is nothing compared to a T-Rex. Scientists digitally reconstructed the dinosaur's jaws and found it delivered a bite three times more powerful than a crocodile. 22 massive muscles gave T-Rex the hardest bite of any known land animal. The weird thing is, these teeth are so tough. Why on earth was that one loose? Is there some infection at the root or something? Could that be making it septicemic? Septicemia, or blood poisoning, can be a killer. Who knows how to work this rig? Yeah, yeah, sure. You do, okay. right? The vet. Is this a major clue to the T-Rex's death? If you thread it up there for us. To find out, they insert an endoscope into the tooth cavity. Furthermore, go up, go up a bit more. Hang on, there's a, no, no, no. Whoa, whoa. It, well, there, 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 there. See that, right there? Right there, the white object. Conical, see this line of serrations? Oh, I see. I, see. It's a I know what, I know what. This you know what this is. is. What is it? This is, this is a, a replacement, replacement tooth. tooth. These guys, they're not like mammals. They don't have baby teeth and adult teeth, and that's it. Yeah. They replace teeth throughout their lives. Like sharks? Like sharks, yep, yeah. and they do this every few weeks or so. The tooth wasn't loose because of an infection, the one growing behind it was pushing it out of the way. Throughout their lives, they, these guys have a never-ending supply of teeth. It's a wonderful dental plan. But one kind of tooth is conspicuously absent from T-Rex's jaws. There are no molars or chewing teeth. 
The Komodo dragon, the world's largest living lizard, also lacks these teeth. It feeds in a very specialized way, ripping massive chunks of flesh from a carcass. Then, with a flick of its neck muscles, it swallows the meat whole. T Rex's 12 powerful neck muscles allows it to feed in a similar way. Even with 500 pounds of meat in its mouth, the dinosaur can throw back its half ton head with ease. T Rex didn't chew but swallowed chunks of meat whole. That's good. Great work. Thank you. My first time. <laughs> but did it hunt or scavenge its food? The answer is inside the stomach. Okay, so we're getting somewhere now. To get to it, the team must rip out the ribs and gastralia. Guys, we're going to go on five, four, three, two, one. Go. Hold on. Oh. Okay, you all right? Yep. Go. Oh, That's not bad. Who ordered the T Rex racker ribs? Yeah. All right, good stuff. That's Brilliant. Bad. But under the gastralia, there is yet another barrier. So, guys, this is peritoneum. Inside here are all the organs. This lines the abdominal cavity, but it also contains all the supply of blood vessels here lymph, nerve. So, we've got to cut through this. We can go delicate here, almost proper surgery. Right. Let's just slice this out. This thin membrane is vital to the animal's well-being. Look, 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 look. OK, let's hold it up and see what we got. Go out at this end. It's like a map. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That is a support for all the abdominal organs inside. So not only have we got ribs, gastralia, yeah. three layers of muscle, but you've also got this, which is really nature's kind of band-aid. So if the guts get lacerated or have a bit of injury, it wraps around them and it, and it seals them up. The team finally reaches the organs of the digestive system. Their contents will uncover if this T-Rex is a hunter or a scavenger, or even if it's starved to death. Steve, come around here, mate. Have a, have a good look. So all of this stuff here is going to be the intestines. OK, great. That's wow. lovely. OK, let's just get under it. That's it. And pull these out. So this is a uh, small intestine, I'm guessing. Small intestine. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> the name small intestine is misleading. Slop it down, guys. <laughs> oh. Oh. Guys, can we get a bit of light in here? Would that be all right? There you go. Okay. Oh, oh, wow. Nice, nice. And it keeps coming. Oh, got it. Oh, okay. my God. Okay. <laughs> Nothing like the taste of T-Rex first thing in the morning. Wow. Right. That is small intestine. Unbelievably big as it um, is. Yeah, unbelievably. There's, there's nothing small about it, my friend. This small intestine is where it absorbs all the nutrients from the food it eats. Typically, less than 4% fat, only traces of protein are going to make it beyond the small intestine. So this is really the powerhouse, and we should be able to learn a lot from this. I'm going to try and free up some of the stomach. The team also start freeing the other part of the digestive system, the stomach. Okay. What secrets will they find inside? And could its contents hold the key to this creature's death? Just spin it round. Oh, it's heavier. Okay. Imagine if it was possible to perform an autopsy on a 65 million year old dinosaur. Well, this team is doing just that, and now they are about to examine the inside of its stomach. Let's cut in this and see what's inside. Already, they know this animal didn't die of old age. 
but a fractured leg could have prevented it from finding food. If it did starve to death, the stomach will be empty. Let's just go into here. It could be bloated. OK, I'm smelling something. Holy moly, that's enough. <coughs> this is not pleasant. Are you ready? Let's go. Just slide it on off. Oh, 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 I think I'm going to oh, add to this in a second. The stomach is brimming with partially digested food. Oh. It certainly didn't die starving. No. <laughs> Come on, guys. Oh. So, what we got here, this is absolutely brilliant. That big, thick, muscular wall here. Wow. This is just like the gizzard, basically, on a bird. And this bit would be the proventricular. So, it's just like the true stomach, true really. Stomach. A human stomach only has one chamber. But like birds and crocodiles, this T-Rex has two, because of the way it eats. T-Rex can rip off and swallow massive chunks of flesh without chewing. Muscles propel this meat down the esophagus and into the first part of the stomach, the proventriculus, where powerful acid starts to break up the food before passing it into the gizzard. So this is the esophagus here, OK? So this is where the food comes okay, in here comes first, in. proventriculus, into the gizzard, oh, which will contract with that big muscle just to grind it up with the acids in here. It's a little bitey, isn't it? I wouldn't drink it. <laughs> Were you considering it? <laughs> it just mixes up the... <laughs> into the gizzard. T-Rex doesn't chew its food with its teeth, but its stomach. <laughs> Any damage to this vital organ could spell trouble for the creature. There's no fresh blood in the stomach, which is important. There's no signs of ulceration that I can see on the stomach lining. Anatomically, guys, to me, this looks normal. Next, the gizzard passes the partially digested food into the intestines, where the dinosaur absorbs the nutrients. Let's get this guy in yeah. over here. There we go. Tori, let's you and I go and check out a small intestine. But I think just taking a good section here it's going to tell us all we need to know. A disease or infection could cause death. I don't think anything would have survived going through there, so I wouldn't worry too much. Oh, come on. Quite a volume pumping through okay. here. So we just going to squeeze that out. Mmm. Oh, lovely. Look at these bits. Mm -hmm. These are worms. <laughs> Amongst this kind of, you know, goo, which is processed food, you can see amongst it some worms. Now, maybe you can catch this thing dripping off my finger. Intestinal worms are parasites that infect the gut and multiply by feeding off the contents of the host's intestines. When you're inside the gut, this food is all being digested and that's producing all kinds of good stuff, nutrients, vitamins. So it's a great place to live if you want to be lazy. And so something like a parasite takes advantage of that. Now, if you have too many parasites, that could cause a real problem because it's taking away some of your own food. And that can make you ill, it can make you not as energetic, it can slow you down, make you more susceptible to other diseases. The question is, could it actually be causing harm to the animal and therefore contribute to its death? Cool. Let's go. Luke and Tori want to find out if the parasite infestation could have been fatal. Well, let's yeah. see what we have in this disgusting here. cesspool of a stomach. While Matt and Steve are left with the delightful job of confirming whether this dinosaur is a hunter or a scavenger. If this thing is a hunter, we should see a lot of fresh yeah, meat, right? Fresh meat, right. And if it's a scavenger, we should probably see a lot of rot meat. Look here. Wow. And I don't think these have been in the gut for terribly long. Look at this. Oh, what's... It's a piece of bone. While the guys forage in the stomach, Tori and Luke want to establish the cause of the parasites in the intestines. How did that T-Rex get infested with worms? The answer is that, obviously, it didn't graze. We've worked out now it's carnivore through and through, but it would have got these from eating the intermediate hosts of these worms.
Depending on which animal a carnivore consumes, a different organism can infect it. Tanzanian lions, feasting on a wide range of creatures, had 19 different types of parasites in their guts. Fossil evidence suggests T. rex gorged itself on a variety of dinosaurs, including other T. rex. One of its main snacks was a herbivore called a hadrosaur. A tooth found lodged between the vertebrae of one belonged to a T. rex. But was this T. rex's parasite infestation large enough to cause its downfall? It's from experience. On the animals I've autopsied that have died from mass parasitic infestation of the gut, there aren't just a few hundred worms, there are literally thousands. And it's really common to get a few worms. I mean, it's some staggering stat, like a, a quarter of the world's human population have some evidence of worm burden. So I don't think there's enough in here or in the bits we've seen to have explained why this beast would have died. So not enough in this situation to, to have been responsible for the death or even the ill health of the T-Rex. Absolutely. Let's call the guys over and see what they've got with that stomach. Guys? Yeah. What have you found? Well, we've learned a lot from this stomach. And we've got some goodies. So, stomach is full of meat, but also full of a lot of broken pieces of bone. And you can see some of these here. Wow. This is part of the foot bone of a raptor dinosaur. If T. rex was like a crocodile, it would secrete incredibly powerful acid in the stomach, allowing it to break down everything, including bone. But T. rex doesn't have this ability. It simply passes it out of its body. A fossilized specimen of its feces, known as a coprolite, had pieces of bone embedded in it. But bones weren't the only thing to get through its system. There's teeth. <laughs> so this wow. is a T-Rex tooth in yeah. its own stomach. So what, from another T-Rex? From yeah. itself, almost certainly from itself. Okay. So when they would crunch through bone like this, they were biting at such a strong force that their teeth would sometimes break and they'd just swallow them. They've also found evidence that could dispel one of the biggest myths about T-Rex. We get questions all the time. What did T-Rex eat? Was it a predator? Was it a scavenger? Well, the meat that we found in the T-Rex stomach gives us some insight into what it was actually feeding on. We have pieces of fresh meat intermingled with pieces of rotten meat. Oh, look at this, that's, that's really gross. They're together. This animal, before it died, had had a meal of something that was alive, something that wasn't. This reflects the current thinking that T-Rex was both a hunter and a scavenger. You're not gonna turn down free protein when you need to fuel that size body. Because the stomach was full, this has also cleared the prime suspect in the death of the T-Rex. We know it didn't die of starvation. That tells us instantly that that broken leg is probably not the game changer for this animal at this stage. But the thing is, we still don't know how this thing died. So guess what? Back inside. Let's go. All right, I'm afraid you're going to say that. Luke still believes the cause of T-Rex's death is to be found in its inner organs. Back in. What they are about to uncover will take them by surprise. Back into the belly of the beast. Veterinary surgeon Luke is about to make his way deeper into the body of this T-Rex. I'm just cocooned, solid bone and muscle. I mean, it's so well protected, the abdomen of this beast, not to mention the rock-solid armor plating of the skin. The stomach and intestine were healthy, providing no clues as to why this creature died. Now, they're investigating the other organs. This here is liver. This is home from home. This looks incredibly familiar to me. Basically, it's the chemical laboratory. Let's get the membrane off of the body. What it does is absorbs all the nutrients from the small intestine. It removes all the toxins from the blood. Oh, Matt, you're going to have to give me a hand. Can you, can you grab that? The liver mops up poisonous substances in the body. <sighs> 
Could a diseased or damaged liver be the cause of death? Careful with all the okay. stomach acid down here. Oh. Wow. We've got to just check the surface for no abnormalities. These guys wouldn't have lived long enough probably to have got cancer or anything, but there's no trauma to the liver. The surface looks quite smooth. There's no cuts or anything like that. It does look good, and there's no massive amount of parasitic scarring or anything like this. To me, it just looks like good, normal, healthy liver. Next up. Check out this thing here. We've got the lung. Ah. But you know what this is? That is an air sac. This lung is not like our lung at all, because birds have air sacs. We don't. My goodness. So it is basically like a massive angry chicken. Yes. Just like birds, T-Rex had balloon-like air sacs either end of its lungs. When T-Rex breathes in, air enters the lung and the rear air sac. The lung strips out oxygen and pushes the spent air into the front air sac. When T-Rex breathes out, the rear sac pumps its air into the lung, extracting more oxygen and forcing the spent gas out of the front air sac and through the nostril. Unlike humans, the lung extracts oxygen continuously throughout the breathing cycle. This is the most efficient way of breathing in the animal kingdom and allows it to perform seemingly impossible tasks. On the summit of Mount Everest, there is only a third of the amount of oxygen there is at sea level. Humans struggle, yet birds can fly at these altitudes with ease. Their air sacs allow them to extract enough oxygen to power their wings and continue to fly. For a seven-ton, 43-foot-long dinosaur, this adaptation would power its massive muscles, allowing it to dominate its environment. I reckon we should get this lung out. All right, I'm going to need some help here, mate. Me too, yeah. Oh! OK, let's get to this. Can you support the weight there for me, please? Oh, oh. oh look at that. Okay, look at that. Oh. I wish I could breathe in and out oxygen right now, <laughs> like a T-Rex. You want this lung? <laughs> I want that lung. Okay, so there is no evidence of disease here, so with one of the two lungs now removed, the team can get to the next vital organ. Look up there. I'm seeing something that looks a little bit like a heart. Can we get some light here, please, guys? Oh, look at that, my heart. The heart is the pump that pushes blood around the body. The bigger the animal, the bigger the heart. Let's cut through some of these vessels and free it up. And the bigger the blood vessels leaving and entering the organ. We're going to have to go through the aorta, the inferior and superior vena cava as well. It's really difficult. Let's cut through this here. <laughs> OK. Uh, Matt, we're going to need some muscles here, pal. OK. Jeez. OK. This is this massive. Is Come on. Oh! Perfect surgery, I'd say. <laughs> but something is puzzling Luke about the heart. It was absolutely exhausting, to be honest, and, and crazily heavy because it's dead weight. But typically, in a mammal, you'd expect the body mass of the heart to be 1% of the body weight. So an animal that weighed about 8 tonnes, that'd be about 80 kilos. And I'm guessing, but that doesn't look 80 kilos to me. So what that tells us is that this heart has to be supremely efficient. And it's going to be fascinating to cut inside because... Fish have two chambers in their heart. Lizards will have three chambers, but it's birds and mammals have four. Hop out, Steve. Let's have a look at that heart. Before they can investigate the inner structure of the heart, the team need to remove a protective membrane. Okay, everyone get that. Oh, we should be able to tear that with our yeah, fingers. Right. Uh, it's like, uh, it's a, <clears throat> so this here is the pericardial sac, and it's basically like a support blanket of the heart. So the heart pumps, expands within this sac. And inside, we've got all the vessels. And this is absolutely amazing. 
Why don't we lift this over, cut it open? Right. All right. His guts. <laughs> Watch the last step. Oh, guts and acid ah. and blood Sweet. and bile. Beautiful. Okay. If it has four chambers, it will be more like a bird than a lizard. That's awesome, isn't it? Look at that. A T-Rex heart. Honestly, look at that thing. It's massive. How could this tiny little pump get the blood around a beast that size? The small size of the heart is a mystery. The answer might lie in its internal structure. So let's go straight into that. Here. Oh, there's going to be some blood here. Look at that. Well, this would be the blood full of oxygen from the lungs that would be sent around the body. Exactly right. Right. All right, let's see what we got. The team is about to uncover the secret of T-Rex's most vital organ. Wow. That is amazing. Inside the heart of the most complete T-Rex ever seen, our experts have discovered a strange substance. This is completely new to me, Luke, so talk me through what you're seeing here. Well, all this stuff here that we can see is clots. Wow. The moment the heart stops, blood clots. So we would expect clots in here. This is absolutely fine. And in fact, looking at this right now, there doesn't seem to be any abnormalities to it. But the structure of this organ can help to shed light on one of the most debated issues. Was it cold or warm-blooded? A clue lies in how many chambers are in the heart. Well, this is a four-chambered heart. This is incredibly evolved, and it does tie in as to why this heart isn't just absolutely massive. Because being so efficient allows it to be smaller. You imagine the heart divided into four. Now, down the middle, we've got a big muscular septum that separates them. So blood comes in from the lungs. It's oxygenated into the left atrium here. Then it passes through the atrioventricular septums here. There's little valves. And it goes down from the atrium into the ventricles. Now, this ventricle, look at that wall. Can you see how thick and muscular that is? This is the left ventricle. But compare it with the right, it's much thinner. And the reason is because this left ventricle then has to compress like that, the powerhouse there, pushing that blood at massive, massive pressure into the biggest artery in this guy's body, all the way up through the aorta. And then that, that blood, oxygenated, then goes into all the muscles, fueling them, giving them the energy they need to do their job. Lizards have a three-chambered heart. This could never generate the required pressure only a four-chambered heart is powerful enough. And this system, combined with an incredibly efficient respiratory system, we've got just the ultimate, ultimate efficiency of fueling those guys' muscles in its body. Every cell and muscle in the body has a rich supply of oxygen, allowing them to work at a high rate. This primes the creature for action and also generates heat, warming the body from within. This is the heart and circulatory system of a warm-blooded creature like a bird, not a cold-blooded creature like a lizard. Something like a croc or a lizard, they have to go out into the sun to get warm. And when it cools down at night, they're going to get cold. They can't grow as fast. They can't move as fast. They can't run as fast. But birds and mammals have four-chambered hearts. They're very efficient. They're warm-blooded animals. They have this internal furnace where the body temperatures are pretty much constant, and you need that consistency to grow fast. So what we're seeing here to me, with the four chambers that we've seen, it looks like just a supersized heart of a bird. So T-Rex was probably a seven-ton killer big bird. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually funny you should mention the bird thing because something has been preying on my mind a little bit, and um, that's those bristles mm. that we noticed right at the very, very beginning. And, of course, you say bird, and that immediately brings up the idea of feathers. And I would love to go and have a better look at those. Should we have a look? Let's do it. We could do the bird. You guys. Good plan. We'll do the killer bit. Right. T-Rex ruled 65 million years ago. New fossil evidence has revealed a link between dinosaurs and feathers 
like the ones on our creature. Right, Steve. When we first encountered the beast here, I looked at these and I thought bristles. They're a little bit reminiscent of uh, the slight stubble you're showing now. Um, I just yank one of these yeah, out. Let's... Like that. I mean, this is so simple. Yeah, so you're right. When you look at this, I mean, it, it kind of has some give to it. It is kind of like a porcupine quill. Or like hair we have. And that's not what we think of when we think of bird feathers. We think of a quill pen type of thing with a long shaft and all the fluffy bits. And of course, in birds, they use feathers to fly. That's not what we're seeing here. This is a much simpler arrangement. And this is what we call proto feathers. These are the ancestral start of feathers. A lot of dinosaurs, maybe even all dinosaurs, had feathers. And we know that because of fossils. We have thousands of dinosaurs from China fossilized, covered in feathers. And then because we have so many fossils, we can trace how feathers change. Those feathers start forming wings on long arms in a small animal with big muscles. And that's how flight evolves. Bird feathers evolved so they interlock forming a flexible wing. At seven tons, T-Rex was never going to fly. But birds don't just use feathers for flight. They're important in display and attracting a mate. Scientists now think T-Rex used its feathers in the same way. These proto feathers on T-Rex give us more evidence of that bird-dinosaur relationship. As the team search for a cause of death, they are revealing much about T-Rex's life. Matt and Luke are now investigating the next big question. How did this seven-ton carnivore kill its prey? If we can understand how it moved, we can understand how it hunted, if we understand how it hunted, we know how it killed. Here's a deal. These legs are, are kind of a funny chimera because you have some bird-like characteristics in the feet, but you also have some other things going on too. Imagine if it was possible to perform an autopsy on the world's most infamous carnivore, T-Rex. Our team of experts have so far discovered the dinosaur didn't die of old age or starve to death. Its full stomach and powerful heart have hinted that it was a fierce and active predator. Now Matt and Luke want to understand how it hunts for food. So did it lie in wait or did it chase? I mean, these muscles, they are huge and it's a bit like, you know, sprinters versus long distance runners, okay? So the sprinters, generally speaking, pretty big guys, you know, great big muscles, explosive power, but long distance runners can just go forever. So what do you reckon? Did this beast just have this sudden surge of power and just come out, just get its animal, but potentially you could outrun it. Predators use ambush and pursuit tactics. Ambush predators try and catch their prey unawares. They select a target and approach stealthily. Their attack is sudden and short-lived. Pursuit predators have a very different strategy. They chase after their prey, trying to outpace their victims. This is a sustained rather than a sudden attack. So was T-Rex a pursuit or ambush predator, or both? The answer lies in understanding how T-Rex moves. Well, when T-Rex wants to start moving, first thing that happens, bam, these toes begin to flex. They dig into the ground because the calf muscle itself, all the way up in the shank, begins to flex and bend and pulls the toes in. While that's happening, the big thigh muscle begins to rock back and forth, powered by these enormous, enormous muscles. 
And then the secret to dinosaur locomotion, the turbocharger kicks in. See this group of muscles right here? This is the cardiofemoralis all the way down, all the way down to here. When this giant muscle group contracts, it gives the dinosaur a lot of leverage, powerfully pulling the knee back towards the tail tip, pushing a T-Rex forward, going after a triceratops or getting away from a triceratops. But that's how T-Rex moved through the world. But were these giant muscles primed for speed? Could this T-Rex outrun its prey, or would it have taken its victim by surprise? One person who knows the answer is scientist John Hutchinson. Animals don't move using just their bones. A dead chicken, its skeleton won't get up and walk around on its own. It needs the muscles, the tendons, the nervous system, and so forth, that actually generates movement in real, live animals. Fossils rarely preserve soft materials like muscles, but they do contain clues to where these tissues existed. What we have here is the right thigh bone or femur of a T-Rex. It's been scaled down by a factor of five or so, but that allows me to hold it and move around and look at it quite easily. What we can tell from it right away is it's got a hip socket right here. So it's got this ball and socket joint that allows the hip to move around a lot. And it's got a knee joint down here, kind of like ours. But we've also got bumps and squiggles on the bones that we call trochanters. And these are where tendons and muscles of the leg attached onto the bone. These trochanters reveal that there are 33 different muscle groups in a T-Rex's leg. Mapping these connections onto a computer simulation, John has made his dinosaur walk. What we're doing with T-Rex is digitally resurrecting it. We're bringing it back to life. Some muscles pull bones in one direction and other muscles pull bones in like the opposite direction. These muscles contract in a precise sequence, propelling T-Rex forward. But how fast could this seven-ton dinosaur run? T-Rex would never have been a thoroughbred racehorse kind of animal, let alone a cheetah. Once you try to get the model going faster than, say, around 25 miles an hour, just not possible. It would have required ridiculously large leg muscles, more than we could fit onto the skeleton of a T-Rex. A T-Rex probably had leg muscles big enough to enable it to do between about 15 to 25 miles per hour. Its huge stature meant that surprise attack was unlikely, but 20 miles an hour was fast enough to chase and catch its prey. Like many advanced apex predators, T-Rex would have used both ambush and pursuit methods. So seven ton beast of power coming towards you, 20 miles an hour. Key question, could you outrun it? <sighs> Not in these boots, could you? I wouldn't need to outrun it. I just need to outrun you. Oh, nice, nice. 65 million years ago, T-Rex was at the top of the food chain powerful enough to prey on anything. This mega predator needed 50,000 calories a day to fuel its massive frame. Okay, so what we've got here is an apex predator. And all apex predators have fantastic senses. Right. Why don't we go to the sharp end and check them out? Let's do it. Acute senses are vital for a predator's survival, allowing them to identify and attack their prey. But how capable were T-Rexes? Hey, guys. Hey. hey. We come out to have a look at these senses. Matt, let's start with the eye. We want to know three key things about these eyes. Firstly, we want to know if it's got monocular or binocular vision. So see how one eye, both eyes at the same time. We want to know how good its sight was. And the third thing is if we stood still, could we actually hide from it? Well, true to form, let's cut it out. I'll be back in a minute. I'll go and get some gear. One thing that I am really interested in is whether this T-Rex could see in color. And this has been a big mystery with dinosaurs for a long time. But just over the past few years, we've gotten some clues, believe it or not, from real fossils. Because if we have colors like we see here on their bodies, 
that's a pretty good sign that they could see in color. Hey guys, I'm back. <laughs> you don't look like a bloody clown anymore. Come on, I'm feeling <laughs> fresh and beautiful. I might not look it, but I can but try it. Eh? Okay, let's get this out. First, going, oh, that is so tough. Okay. Have you ever removed the eye of something this big before? I removed a frog's eye once. Hmm. Cow's eyes, lots of dog's eyes, a few cat's eyes, but never a T-Rex eye. Huh. Now just okay. gently give it some tension. You do it from this side. What we want to do is we want to remove the eye intact. That's a crucial part of how we get to look at its structures, how it works, understand its function. So I've placed two anchoring sutures here, which Tori and Matt are going to put some gentle pressure on. I'm then going to cut nice and big around here and we'll dissect underneath. And as they pull it, we should be able to get that eye out. Now behind the eye is going to be an optic nerve and there's going to be a vessel. So we might be getting a bit of blood out of this. But let's just see what we got. I'm going to go with a free blade just to give me a bit more flexibility. OK, so sorry, so just mind your fingers. Just pull that a little bit there. The skin is actually coming away a little bit easier around here, which you'd ex expect. OK, good. Well, so far, this is really similar. This is home turf, removing this. I wonder if I can get behind. If you guys put a little bit, just get a clamp ready and just lift it out a little bit here. We've just got to get this eye out in one piece. I don't want to burst this eye. It's going to ruin everything. Right round. Look at this. You know what this is here? Optic nerve, OK? Wow. So this massive cable, magic, like a huge, great data cable, is taking all the information here from the eye, surging it up this cable, which is going to the brain. I'm just going to cut this here. Tore my glove a bit. The autopsy team are extracting one of T-Rex's eyes to see how well it could sense its prey. With an optic nerve this big, I mean, this thing must have had great eyesight. And we're, look, there's a bit of blood here as well. We'd expect that. It's fine. Oh. OK, great. One eye removed. All right. Nicely done. OK, let's get it over. The large Amazing. optic nerve suggests T-Rex could see well. Yeah, well, I don't know. OK, this do? Yep. yep. Right. There Dissecting the eye will reveal its inner workings. Right. See what we've got. So, if you have a good look at this eye, we can all relate to this. So let's slice this off and see what we got. Get them out of the way. And then let's just dissect this bit off here. So how like a human eye is this? Whoa. Well, I mean, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, this eye. And like us, there's a big cornea here. And then you see all that fluid under there? That's the anterior chamber. Okay. And then beneath that, we can see in there the pupil lens. Obviously, <laughs> we wouldn't normally have a bubble of air in there, but I've, I've nicked the cornea here. Oh, yeah. You can see the, the humor's coming out a little bit. But you huh. know what? There is, this just feels a, a bit... Tori, have a squeeze of that. Now, that yeah. is something we definitely don't have Yeah, it's pretty rigid. There. Wow. OK, that's hard. Like bone, almost. Uh, really hard. Ring of <laughs> bone in there, I think. That's not like us. That yeah. there is a sclerotic ring. So mammals don't have sclerotic rings. Mm. But actually, these things are much more advanced than our eyes. The sclerotic ring is formed of interlocking bony plates that hold the shape of the eye in place. It anchors powerful muscles that alter the shape of the lens very quickly, allowing the eye to change focus in an instant. Guys, look at it in the flesh here. Oh, wow. Okay. And there, it's like an onion ring. <laughs> is your sclerotic ring. So the muscles will attach here, and as they contract, it's going to help it focus its vision much sharper than we'd be able to do that. These thin bones don't fossilize well. Few complete sclerotic rings have ever been found. They're very, very rare. I mean, I must say, of all the dinosaurs I've dug up and all the ones I've studied in museums, I mean, I can probably count the number of good sclerotic rings that I've seen on one hand. These sclerotic rings in a T-Rex has yet to be found, but in T-Rex's cousin, Tarbosaurus from Asia, 
we do have some specimens that show the same bony eye ring. Here we're going to have the lens and this bit here, the iris. And the iris controls the light levels getting into the eye. And then if we go through, look here. And can you see, oh, that's just magic. Look mm. at that. And that's, that's what they do, they slip out. That's exactly right. This is the lens and just feel how lovely and smooth that is. It's just great. So the image is focused through that lens onto the back of the eye, onto the retina. And then through that, it travels down this thing here, the optic nerve, the massive data cable that powers it to the brain. Right in to what's called the optic lobes, these parts of the front of the brain where all of that information from the eye is processed. And in tyrannosaurs, those are really big. So that's another sign it had a good sense of sight. T-Rex didn't just hunt with its eyes. It may have been extinct for 65 million years, but the latest technology is uncovering new information about its other senses and they are just as remarkable. One of the amazing things is that we can use CAT scanners to study senses in dinosaurs. Very high-powered x-ray. Yes, we can do that with dinosaur skulls. So we actually have very good evidence from CAT scanners of what a T-Rex brain would have been like. The brain of a T-Rex was pretty big in relation to its body size. That's what's important. If you're really big, you're going to have a big brain, but it's that relationship to your size. Yeah. So there's a measurement, a statistic, that we can use to put a number on that. And it's called an encephalization quotient, or EQ for short. And it's just a measure of brain size to body size. The number in a tyrannosaur is about 1.2. It was a pretty smart animal. T-Rex is more than twice as intelligent as a crocodile. The CAT scans also reveal its other senses prime T-Rex to detect prey. Massive nasal cavities gave it an acute sense of smell. An amazingly large inner ear allows it to hear sounds over huge distances. T-Rex had the senses of a perfect predator. So they were pretty smart beasts because they had to process all this information from really complex eyes with great senses. Now let's pretend I'm smelling absolutely lovely, not easy to imagine, <laughs> and I'm quiet as a mouse, and I see the T-Rex come around the corner, and I decide to stand still. What are my chances? I think you've maybe seen this in the movies. This idea that if T-Rex is chasing you, stop, stand still, and it can't see you. But that's just movie magic. Like us, it had binocular vision. It had depth perception. Impala have eyes on the side of their head, allowing them to see in nearly every direction. Perfect for spotting approaching predators. Ambush predators like crocodiles often have a similar field of vision. Their eyesight overlaps only slightly over its snout. Here, it sees with binocular vision. In this narrow arc, perception of depth and 3D shapes is increased. T-Rex had a far wider field of binocular vision, giving it a superior ability to detect and attack its prey, even if its target was standing still. And so if this T-Rex was chasing you, he would see you and he would eat you. OK, Steve. That's all oh, very, very convincing, yeah. except for one slight thing. Yeah. You keep saying he. OK, T-Rex, king of the dinosaurs. King of the dinosaurs. Except what we don't know about this creature was, was it male or female? That's right. T-Rex or she-Rex? It's something we need to find out. That means it's a waste of time changing my scrubs, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's have a look, find out. It's time for the team to sex the Rex. If they discover it's sexually active, they will know it is generally healthy. And if so, what can they rule out as its cause of death? That's good, right, you just took it the way. Down here is where you might expect, were it a male, to find a penis. At least if you were a mammal, you would. This, of course, isn't a mammal. It's something that's related, we think, to a bird. And birds, some males have penises and some don't. So the absence of a penis here 
doesn't tell us anything about whether this is male or female whatsoever. Look at this. The T-Rex autopsy team is exploring this creature's anatomy to find the cause of death. Now they want to sex it. This could uncover how the seven-ton dinosaur mated and possibly how it died. Here we have an opening. And this opening, if I get inside, I kind of feel around and see what's going on. Now this is what's known as the cloaca. It's a single opening where everything comes out. So the waste products, so wee, poo, things like that, but also sperm. And if it was a female, that's where it would pop out an egg. So having a feeling here might give us some clues as to what we're dealing with, male or female. One thing though that really interests me as I'm in here having a big feel, it's really tight actually, I can't get my arm up. As I'm here, it's probably actually, so what I don't know about is if there's any fossil evidence at all for T-Rex gender. With dinosaur fossils, a lot of bones, sometimes if we're lucky, feathers, muscles, skin, but as far as I know, dinosaur genitals, never. So I think this is one of the biggest mysteries. Yeah. When we find a dinosaur, is it a male, is it a female? We just can't tell. Yeah, and of course in birds, the difference there is that the ones that don't have penises, when they're having sex, they have to push their cloacas up against each other. It's called a cloacal kiss. In some birds, mating is a balancing act. The male mounts the female, but as he doesn't have a penis, he has to transfer the sperm by contact. This is the cloacal kiss. Imagine trying to do that with a seven-ton beast. Seven times two. <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah. I mean, elephant, it's like a big male African elephant, weighs seven tons, and you can't imagine that happening. I mean, there's, there really is nothing I can feel in here. It just, it just feels like a tight passageway. I've got no identifying features whatsoever, so I'm really sorry, Luke. It's back over to you. There's only one way we can answer this question, and I think it's going in at the other end from the inside. OK, back in the office. All right, Steve, look, mate, grab a light. And, All right. Uh, join I'll, me in. I'll follow you to hell and back. <laughs> Luke and Steve are entering the abdominal cavity to search for reproductive yeah, organs. On, back into the belly of the beast. I don't know what I'm looking at, so you got to explain. Let's cut through this here, yeah. because this looks a bit familiar. What we've got to do is we've got to find where there's basically testy, internal testy, like elephants, for example, have internal testy, or ovaries. And the only way to do that is have a look at a few more of these abdominal organs that we haven't yet checked out. So I'm just cutting through here to look inside and see what this is. It's in exactly the right place. And oh my goodness me. What do we got? Well, what this is, is an ovary. All right. Female. So he is definitely <laughs> a she. So she would have hunted you down and he she, <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for that, Steve. Birds generally only have left ovaries. They're born right. with two, but one pretty much just is vestigial. It doesn't really do it. Yeah, lot, we so. think that happened in an evolutionary sense because as birds started to fly, they needed to lighten their skeleton and they lost one of the ovaries. That's what we think. Brilliant. So did, yeah. did uh, dinosaurs have two ovaries or, or one ovary? Well, we don't know directly because we don't find fossil ovaries, but what we do have are the eggs. And because eggs of dinosaurs, including very close relatives of T-Rex, are laid in pairs, that's a pretty good sign they had left and right ovaries, both laying eggs at about the same time. So look how it works here, right? All of these are basically eggs to be. She would ovulate, okay. right? And the ova would travel down the oviduct. And it moves down. And look at the thickness of this. In birds, when a follicle is mature, it bursts and releases an ovum from the ovary into the oviduct. If it encounters a male sperm, they fuse to form an embryo. As this travels down the oviduct, cells add layers of supporting protein, the white. This protects the embryo and provides it with water. It then enters the uterus, whose walls spin the embryo downwards. Finally, specialized cells secrete calcium carbonate onto its surface, forming the eggshell.
So guys, could you just have another really good feel and just see if there's anything up there at all because she was definitely ovulating here. No problem. I clearly didn't get my arm up quite far enough. Okay. This time we're gonna really put my back into it. All right. What are you feeling in there? The walls of the cloaca are really kind of gripping onto my arm. Are they soft, the walls of the cloaca? The strongest support stockings you could ever imagine. Wow. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Something hard? Yeah. But I can only touch it with my fingertips. Yeah. I think some forceps or something that I can extend the length of my arm. All right. Bye. Yeah, well, let me go find something. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Oh. The very tips of my fingertips, I can feel something solid. But because I couldn't really get my fingers around the edges of it or get any kind of traction, I couldn't really get a sense of its shape. Forceps, hopefully, I'll be able to get around it, give it a tug and draw it out. Luke? Yeah? Could you come out? I'm going to go in with the forceps, but I could do with a little bit of veterinary instruction. At the you same found time. something? Come on, Fora. Okay, you've got them in close. Just slip them up yeah. a little bit and then part them as far as you can. And then tease them round it. And once you're right round, it should be quite stable. Can you get around it? Okay, you good, you got it? I think so. Tease it out. Right. Slip it down. There's something coming. Can you see in there? Oh, I can see something. It's coming. Take it out. All right, slowly, slowly, slowly. You've got your hand in position. Just in case. Got it? Think so. Tori is trying to ease an object from the cloaca of the T-Rex. The team has discovered this is a She-Rex, and she's fertile. Oh, oh look brilliant. at that. Oh, it's beautiful. Brilliant job. Oh. Okay. It's Tori's job to deliver the baby. I could do the last bit with my hands. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Do, do it, yeah. Right. Just tease it. It's going to go in there. So... Okay. Beautifully done. Great. Oh, it's still coming as well. Okay, that's much more elongated than I expected. It is like a torpedo. It is, isn't it? Oh, look at that. Check it out. That's beautiful. Beautiful as it is, I think we really ought to crack it open and look inside. Okay, I'm gonna hold fire here. I just, I've just still niggled. We haven't got a cause of death. Everything so far just checks out great. And, and we're missing a trick. So I'm just gonna have another look round. You guys get into that. The team decides the quickest way into the egg is using a vibrosaur. At the T-Rex, Luke thinks he's found some new evidence, something that could explain how the dinosaur died. It's brilliant news about the egg, but not laying that egg didn't kill her. You know, and I still don't know why she died. We're definitely missing the trick, and we cannot leave her without knowing what resulted in this. We know she was eating, she didn't starve to death. We know all her internal organs checked out fine. There's no massive disease process going on that would have slowly given her a chronic illness and brought her down. There's something else going on. And I just remembered when we found that leg, the only clue I had was just that bit of give, that bit of crepitus under the skin. And I've come back here and I'm getting the same thing. You can see here that it's quite tight. It's just rock solid. Whereas just here, if you have a look, you can see the sweep of the muscle and there's a slight bulge here, just slightly goes up and that's odd because she's flat laying down. And if you push, can you see that? That just gives a bit more, doesn't it? Just there. And it's exactly the same sort of feeling as I got when I checked out that leg. So what we've got to do is check this out because if there's neck trauma, now that potentially is a life ending situation and that could mean sudden death. Luke calls in the radiographer to scan the beast. X-rays. Right. Thank you. Okay. Wow. All right, well, this is the moment of truth. 
this is oh wow okay. now I don't want to crack this yoke because I go over that's all the white coming out must be a couple of liters <laughs> wow clearly this isn't a very well developed embryo no. so it's only going to be a few days old at most but what you can see is the white around the outside, as you'd expect in a chicken egg, and then of course this broken yolk in the middle. Um, but within that yolk, this is red spot just here. This is the exciting bit of the business end because this shows us that the egg has been fertilized because this is the germinal disc. Germinal and disc. And tiny and unprecessing as it is, from tiny things, great things grow. So we're gonna go from this all the way to that. <laughs> hey Luke, come here, you gotta see this. What have we got? Come and have a look at this. Squelching over to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna like this one. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, she definitely was pregnant then. Look at that. Awesome. Really, really good. I wonder how long they incubated eggs for. I mean, a chicken incubates his eggs for about 24 days, and an ostrich is 40, so I don't know I mean, how... that's the size of an ostrich egg, right? Not too far off. Yeah, a good shape. If the T. rex embryo developed in the same way as an ostrich, first the nervous system, heart and spine would form. Then its limbs. And finally, the skin and claws. See, chickens will lay an egg every day. In 24 hours, they pop an egg out. Did they sit on their eggs? Do you know? No idea. Something like that, sitting Chicken. on its eggs? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> if you could imagine. Other dinosaurs, though, we know did. Small dinosaurs, the very bird-like dinosaurs with feathers. And not only did they sit on their nests, but they used their feathers to protect their eggs, to guard their eggs just like birds. So maybe T-Rex did that too, somehow. You know, we haven't actually found a T-Rex nest or anything really that size, but, you know, if it did lay big nests, and I'm sure it obviously did, it must have had to excavate a large crater in order to lay its eggs. Could it sit on them, though? That's a lot of mass to put on a little thing, so I, I don't... Oh, I'd, I'd like to see yeah. that. Hey, you know what? I found something, too. Come and have a look at this. All right. With the discovery of a healthy reproductive system, the team is still no closer to finding the cause of death. But has Luke found something significant near the neck. Guys, I found, um, I found some more crepitus, more swelling on the neck, so I asked Kat here to run a few more x-rays for us. Imagine if it was possible to perform an autopsy on one of the world's largest carnivores, Tyrannosaurus rex. A team of experts has dissected the creature in a quest to find the cause of death. All right. Its full stomach revealed it didn't die of starvation, but its content showed T-Rex was both hunter and scavenger. This is not pleasant. These are worms. Oh, look at this, that's, that's really gross. This animal, before it died, had had a meal of something that was alive and something that wasn't. A loose tooth showed no signs of infection, but revealed it had the teeth of a reptile. I think T-Rex could have easily, it could have probably bitten through your Land Rover. When they cut into the belly, they encountered a second set of ribs. This feature, that's a croc feature. They cut into its heart to find signs of disease and found it had the heart of a bird. Wow. Yeah, first, proventriculus. A stomach that chews food. Which will contract with that big muscle just to grind up with the acids in here specialized bird-like lungs that power its giant muscles. Oh, look at that. Okay, look at that. Oh. They discovered a leg fracture, and the king of the dinosaurs ran on its tiptoes. There's nothing croc-like about this. This looks like an overgrown chicken. And something else. These are the ancestral start of feathers. T-Rex's closest living relatives aren't crocodiles, but birds. Veterinary surgeon Luke thinks he might have a new lead as to why this dinosaur died. Cat, how'd it go? 
Got some nice pictures, did four or five up through the neck and I've just pasted them together and they're just on the way over. You can see here, guys, look at this. This clean break to the neural spine here, but the fracture line going through the vertebral body and that would have severed the spinal cord, just broken it clean. She would have stopped breathing instantly and that would have been death. No coming back from that. And it ties in, sadly, but it does explain that huge trauma in the back leg, the clean break there. And then there was quite a bit of blood inside, wasn't there, when we were around, and that would explain a big trauma and a fall. And I guess she landed on her neck, broke it. Game over. Really sad, but you know what? This isn't actually a story of death. The real treasure in this is a story of life and how she was anything but primitive. In actual fact, she was one of the greatest and most evolved predators in the history of planet Earth. For our experts, after years of studying bones, the opportunity to dig into the flesh of a T-Rex was the dream of a lifetime. Just getting that chance to sort of, you know, get to grips with it and see it in three dimensions is just supremely helpful in terms of understanding what's going on. I'm used to working with dry, dead bones. I have never gotten this filthy, dirty, disgusting in my entire life. Climbing into a Tyrannosaurus Rex oh, cadaver, okay. that sort of close proximity, it's, it's indescribable. You just have to see it to believe it. This is so much different from digging up bones out in the desert, which is what I usually do. I think the heart, maybe more than any other organ, really told us about how this dinosaur lived. This wasn't a little lizard. This was a big bird. You come into contact with people in different spheres of life. You know, I'd never sort of have the pleasure of bumping into these guys or working with them normally. You know, we work in completely different worlds and coming together and getting all that bounce and having a good crack with it, just great. I now can tell my kids stuff about T-Rexes and it's thanks to Matt Stephen Torrey, who, you know, I've gained loads. This groundbreaking creature took six months and over 10,000 man hours to build. It was modeled on the most complete T-Rex skeleton ever found with scientific input from the world's leading experts, pulling together all their latest theories into a practical anatomically correct creature has allowed our team to see T-Rex in a whole new light.